Welcome back to Nick Lennon's Comic Corner, Classic Class Known Classics. This is episode number 14, uh, 1524, and double number uh, 1524, double number 1418. Now I have one DC trade, one Marvel trade. First up it is Wonder Woman, the Cheetah. Yeah, this collects some sporadic appearances of Cheetah since her debut. As a matter of fact, they actually have her debut. The, well, the original Cheetah, Priscilla Rich. If you're curious, though, how many Cheetahs have there been since this first appearance? The answer is four. Yep, four. But here's a question for you. Who is the most known version of the Cheetah? Is it Priscilla Rich, the original one? Nope. Is it her niece? Yes, her niece. I believe her name is, um... Oh, what was her name? Uh, let's see here. It is, um, the second one was Deborah Damonte, the third one was Barbara Minerva, and the fourth one, who, I kid you not, here's the thing about the fourth one, by the way, the fourth one, they actually don't have his, his parents in here, nope, they don't, they only have parents by the first three, and not the fourth one, okay, who was the fourth one? His, his, yes, the fourth one is a guy. Yes, it was obviously a point of a wonder one. You're a guy. His name is Sebastian Bestros. He was around for a very brief period of time before Barbara Nova came back and murdered the man. Yep, for daring to assume the name of the cheetah. Yes, he is the creation of Phil Jimenez and Joe Kelly. Now, the original version was created by one of his one of its creator, William Malton Morrison, and the co-writer, the co-person is how uh, uh, H. G. Porter, Peter, excuse me. And this guy basically was the original Wonder Woman artist. I'm not kidding about that. Yeah, this guy was the original Wonder Woman artist. So, yet the creators of Wonder Woman, who not only created Wonder Woman, but also Priscilla Rich, the original Wonder Woman. Uh, no, uh, the original Cheetah. Yes. And this book has the very first appearance from Wonder Woman number six. Yes. Here it is. Wonder Woman number six. And that's it right there. Priscilla Rich. And for some reason, they just have her first appearance, not her other appearance that she made. If you're curious, the Wolverine's or next appearance was actually an issue of Sensation Comics. I looked this up. Yeah, her appearances were like about four or five appearances overall. She appeared in this issue. She appeared in Sensation Comics, I believe it was like 28, I think it was. Uh, it was like 20-something, I think it was. Let me look it up and see here. Priscilla Rich. Mm-hmm. Let's see if I can find it here. I will get to her fate because I actually bring it up in here. The original one from Earth 2, like I said, appeared in the issue 6 of Wonder Woman. And then she reappeared in her next appearance was in an issue of Sensation Comics. Yes. It was Sensation Comics number 22. Uh, 36, she appeared in that one too, but it was a flashback. She also appeared in... I think this was a reprint. Yeah. Uh, her early appearances were... Comic Club came number 11. That was actually her very next appearance. And then she appeared in Wonder Woman 28. Let's see. Was this a reprint?
Okay, she also appeared in uh, DC's Batch number 3, Infinity Inc. number 7, 22, JLA Sega Files and Orders number 1. Uh, she appeared in 118, that was a reprint, uh, 101, 186, 230. Let's see. Well, she did appear in 160, and of course, 166. Yeah, she was basically appeared for a long time. Yeah, appearance in issue 28, uh, where she, prior to that, she had basically tried to reform, but then she turned back to Villainy when she became part of Villainy Incorporated. Villainy Incorporated actually did make a return recently in the pages of Greg Ruckus or for Wonder Woman. If you're curious about Villainy Incorporated, they're pretty much a group of Wonder Woman villains. You can kind of think of them as Wonder Woman's Sinister Six. Or, like, the Superman Revenge Squad. It's basically a union of uh, Wonder Woman villains, the fighter. And basically like a six-on-one handicap match. That's the simple gist of it. And the second one... The, uh... The second one, Deborah Diamante, she was in fact the very second version of the character. Excuse me, yeah, she was the second version of the character. Who, this book does collect her very first appearance in Wonder Woman 274. And she was the creation of Jerry Conway. Yes, and her first appearance was, this is not a joke. Six years before Christ and for Nerfs. Yep, and she and her co creator was Jose D. Blue. I think he may have passed away by now. I don't know if this guy is still alive. Oh, he is still alive. I think so. Let me take a look at this. He may or may not be alive. He must, must be like really old. Like, probably. Oh, he, he's still alive. He's 87. Yep, he's 87 years old. That's how old the guy is. Now, this version of Deborah, aside from appearing in this two-parter for Wonder Woman, one was 274, 375, she next appeared in three issues of Just Like America, 195 to 97. It was a crossover with uh, the JSA, one of the annual team-ups. She was part of a team that fought both teams. Appeared in, well, Wonder Woman 323, an issue of Christ and Heaven Earths, and Sanish Concrete to Wonder Woman. And that's it for the character. Yep. Like, her story in here is that Cobra wanted the cheetah to basically take out, well, Wonder Woman. But they found Priscilla Rich. And she was too old to be the cheetah. So, they had her beautiful niece become the cheetah. Now, if you're curious though, what the heck did Priscilla Rich, uh, Deborah look like as the cheetah? You might ask. Well, she looked like this. Well, she pretty much put on the same exact outfit as her aunt, as her aunt did, except this one was a little bit more sexualized. Yeah, it's essentially the same outfit her aunt wore, except that, well, exposed a little more skin because it's the seventies, not the forties, and they had this two parter, which I'm glad they did this. They include this two parter in here. And, like, I think some of the other women who became Wonder Woman, aside from Van Arbonerva, like, she got, like, the early parents to collect in trade. Like, uh, the Cheetah, Priscilla Rich. Now, the one Cheetah who basically people know is Barbara Ann Minerva, who made her first parents in Wonder Woman Volume 2, Number 7, where she's the creation of George Perez. And this one made her debut in live action in... The one of 1984 film. Which is quite interesting though. The movie is set in 1984. Roughly three years before her comic book debut. <laughs> which I think is quite hilarious. To say the least. Yes. Now. It was actually issue 9. Excuse me. Uh, the actual book itself was actually well. Written by George Perez. He did the artwork. But cold down by Lean, the late Lean Ween. Excuse me. And. This cheetah, which the story is called Blood of Cheetah, by the way. 
This cheetah is still active to this very day. Heck, they've included a really good team with her and the second reverse flash. Where, get this, in story, like, in order to become a better villain, at the recommendation of Hunter Zolomon, get this, she had to kill Priscilla Rich, the original Cheetah. And she did. Look up at the off oh, panel. But yeah, she murdered Priscilla Rich. Oh yeah, and here's something interesting though. Uh, Deborah does exist at, at this point in time post crisis. Never appeared post crisis, from what I can tell. Nope, never did. And at the end of the two parter, they meet up with Dr. Psycho, another classic Wonder Woman villain, who still has to make appearance in live action for some reason. Oh, yeah, and if you're curious, still, like, you read the story, like, wait, why the heck is Wonder Woman wearing a blindfold? Well, that was something that Greg Rucker was doing in the book at that point. I was reading this, like, recently, the last couple of years, not when it came out. Uh, that was due to a fight she had with Medusa. She had to blind herself because her eyes became poisoned. Oh, don't worry, I got fixed later on, so don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. It was a really good two-parter. And here's something by just some weird coincidence. Greg Rucker's run ended 10 issues after this two-parter wrapped up. Yes, yeah, seriously. And here he is. Here's Dr. Psycho, which I think is so interesting, though. We had the cheetah work with Dr. Psycho. And it's very heavily implied, that based on the way the cheetah is written here, that she's basically attracted to Hunter Zolomon. A guy who... From what I can tell, still kind of loves his ex-wife, despite the fact that the cheetah, who is a very beautiful woman, is attracted to him. Now, of course, the very next time they actually, next story they have here for cheetah, is the first appearance of the post-Flashpoint version of Barbara Nerva. From Justice League Volume 2, Issue 13. Yes, 14's here too. Now, you probably know about this design. This is a design done by Tony S. Daniel. Yes, he is responsible for this very story. He did the artwork for the story, and Jeff Johns did the writing. Yeah, it's simply put, basically, where they kind of reveal that she, that Barbara Nerva is an old friend of Diana's, which they probably used that as a plot device in the one on the film where they were friends before he, she became the cheetah. In the comics, oh, here's a little fun fact for you. When she first met Wonder Woman, what did she decide to do? Use her tail to try to hang Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah, just like how Slipknot tried to do the same thing when actual hangman's used to try to murder freaking Firestorm. While he's talking to the beautiful Firehawk, which I think is so interesting. I don't know if Conway probably suggested that to George Perez, but that would just by sheer coincidence. Do you want proof of this? The fact that Barbara Nerva did this? Where she when she first met one of one, this is basically what she did. Like Like here she is trying to hang Wonder Woman. Yes. And the neat thing about Barbara Nerva is that she's the first cheetah to not have a cheetah costume. Nope, it's not a cheetah costume. It's a full transformation to a cheetah, and this is well. This is probably the, the version used for the Justice League animated series. Excuse me. Now, after this two-parter, which, by the way, this kind of helped set up the events of Trinity War, by the way, which she got recruited to the Secret Society, and they also included in here. Her Villains Month one-shot, which, thank you for DC putting it in here. For some reason, if you're a little curious though, DC never reprinted this in any of the Wonder Woman trades. Yeah, here's the thing about this one-shot. It came out when Brian Azzarello was the writer of the book. Yep, but did DC bother to collect it? Nope, they never did until this very trade. This one-shot was also the debut, well, first post-Flashpoint appearance, of Mark Shaw, a.k.a. the Manhunter. But at this point, he was a U.S. Marshal. Before Brian Michael Bendis made him a Leviathan. 
Which, that was a really good plot twist. I thought that was quite interesting. I like that. I mean, he had hits of Villain May before over the years, thanks to the thanks to some post up now chemicals in his thanks to chemicals in his head that was basically put there by the council. So, yeah, actually, wasn't council it was more like uh, the Manhunters, which I thought basically was kind of interesting. But I don't think Ben has ever really explored that. As a matter of fact, since Event Love Hyphen and wrapped up, I think he's made sporadic appearances since then, but he hasn't really done very much. The last story they included in here. Which, it's quite surprising they included this in here. They included Wonder Woman vo issue 8 of the most recent run by Greg Rucka. Yes, I believe this is part of the... I think, if I remember correctly, this interlude story was part of the flashback stuff. Because the way that Greg Rucka had his run is that because it came out twice a month, he would write two story arcs. Well kind of go back and forth where the even number of issues would tell the present day stuff while in the case the odd number of issue well extras even was past issues odd was the present day stuff that was simply the purpose of his run and this is basically kept up the entire run as a matter of fact like the the other stork working on that point the leem sharp basically he was working on the present day stuff while in the case of Nicola Scott, who was the other artist of the book, she worked on the past stuff for the book. And if you read this run, one uh, not one Chidi gets a redesign. I did talk briefly to Liam Sharp about this. Uh, like, apparently Tony S. Neal had no problem with the fact he redesigned Cheetah, because if anybody's ever read Cheetah in this era... She looked drastically different. And here's something quite interesting though about the cheetah. Is that, well, she of course, throughout the whole entire Greg Rucker run, was in human form. She was practically cured of being the cheetah. Yeah, she was practically cured of being the cheetah. Now this design right here, this is the, that's the Liam Sharp design. Yeah, he practically redesigned the character. Look a bit a little more ferocious. Now, this design here, if I can, thank you. Uh, this design here, I believe, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is the redesign done by um, George Perez. Uh, the one I showed off here is, in fact, the redesign for uh, Tony S. Daniel. Which is also in the back cover, yeah. Yeah, this is the Tony S. Daniel design for the Cheetah. And, well, like I said, Tony and Daniel apparently had no problem with the fact that, well, here's kind of the strange thing, though, about the Cheetah. From the moment she showed up in 2012 until 2016, she had the same design. Apparently, no one wanted to change her look very much at all as a Cheetah. And then, all of a sudden, Liam Sharp decided to drastically redesign her for Grokka's run. And now she's still keeping that design. Yep, she is. I thought that was kind of weird, but that's simply what it is. Uh, this book is actually pretty good. Uh, give the book roughly a, uh, I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. It's really good. I kind of wish to do more stuff for the Cheetah. Though, here's the thing. The only reason why they did this trade, excuse me, in my opinion, was because she showed up in the Wonder Woman movie. One, excuse me, Wonder Woman T4. That's the only reason why they did this trade. It was done as a promotional piece of the movie. They also did the same thing for Maxwell Lord. Where this is, there was actually a clip some of his appearances too. Though the thing is, uh, Barbara Nerva, I think made her debut, I think it was either before or after Maxwell. Because I think he made debut around the same time. Because he also made his debut in 1987 as well. Though that was in Justice League number one. Not the 
new not the Jeff Johns book. That was done by Keith Giving Jamie Demarius and Kevin McGuire. Kevin McGuire does not like the villainous patrol approach to Maxwell Lord. He told me this the first time I met him. He did not like it at all. He thought that the whole villain villain idea of Maxwell Lord is an absolute dumb idea. He absolutely despised it. I have not spoken to Jane Demarius or Keith Giff about, about this whole thing with Maxwell being a villain. Because only Ken McGuire has told me about Max Lord's villain and stuff. But if I get a chance to meet any of the artists, like, in the case the artists work in this thing, well, the ones working for Priscilla Rich, no longer alive. Um, Conway, I know it is, so I could probably get this for him this time. I guess, well, he does a couple of shit in here. Uh, Tony S. Daniel, definitely, because he's still around. Uh, Lean Wing, he is another one, basically, is no longer around, because he passed away. If you're curious when he passed away, because I know he, he's, he's no longer around. I kind of wish I met the guy. Yes, that is a sad thing. I never got a chance to meet Lean Wing when he was alive. Nope. Brittany Reinstein, yes, I did get a chance to meet him. Awesome guy. I think he was an amazing person when he was, well, I love the guy's artwork. I told him this in person. I even told him I really enjoyed Batman the Colt. He, he was kind of surprised the fact I actually I, he I told him that because I'm sure he felt this doll Batman the Colt was not a good story for him. But I liked the story. I thought it was a really good story. And he also did tell me he did actually kind of enjoyed working with Jim Starr on the story. And I think that was probably like the only Batman story he worked on. If I remember, I think I had. I don't think it was a Swamp Thing book. I don't remember what, what I had him sign. This was like, oh, about four years ago, I think this was, when, when, when I met Bernie Wright, Steve. Uh, you might think, okay, Conway, how have I met Conway for? Yes, I have. I met Jerry Conway, I think this was about three years ago, I met him. It was at Comic Con. And I talked to him about Firestorm on TV. He loves that. He likes the most recent version of the Punisher. And he also loves the fact that Vixen is on TV. He even told me that he like he almost really loves Vixen. Because when I met him, I got him to sign the Vixen one shot for the Just Like America Rebirth one shots. That's what I got him to sign. So now next time I meet him, I can bring a Punisher book and this book from the sign. Yep. All right, moving on to a different book. We have Spider-Man, the Life Tablet Saga. Yep, this basically collects Amazing Spider-Man 1675 and Spider-Man Lifeline 1. The Spider-Man Lifeline 3 Asian mini series. Now, I'm not going to discuss the Amazing Spider-Man issues. Why, you might ask? Because I've already discussed them. Now, the Lifeline miniseries, which is done by Fabian the Caesar. Yeah, Fabian the Caesar does the writing for the book. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it here. Because it's only three issues. Yeah. Let's see. It is uh, Steve Rude who does... Yeah, it's Steve Rude and John Bushma. Who does the artwork for the Lifeline miniseries? The cover art, I think this is done by Alex Ross. Is it? Uh, it doesn't say in the book. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, it doesn't say who the cover artist is for this one. I don't know. But this is mostly like a sequel to that story. Yeah. A mini series deal with a sequel to that one, and it brought it back and the whole thing about Lifeline stuff. The lizards involved again. Now, who's the main villain? This storyline is it Silvermane again? No, it is actually. I kid you not. It's actually Hammerhead. Yep, it is actually a pretty good mini series. I always get handed to Fitness Season for that. Yeah, that's mostly put what the mini series is. It's a revisit to that, but it's not like retelling this same exact story. It just focuses on different villain get his hands on the on the on this tablet. Yep. Great book. Uh just gonna get a mini series of nine out of ten. It's pretty good. Yep. So yeah, that's it for Sickle of You. Next one, two more like one more comic corner, and then 
dra uh, drugstore in another world. And that probably it for tonight, okay? Next video. Bye.